There, it's me, Annalisa Boyd, Orthodox Christian wife, mom to 10, bread baker, candy maker, self proclaimed doula, accidental midwife, and the author of The Aesthetic Lives of Mothers Hear Me, Special Agents of Christ, and creator of Saintsbox.com. So, today I wanted to talk about homeschooling. I know we're, we're facing another interesting year, I feel. <laughs> um, so many schools, I mean, everything's really up in the air about. Um, how education is going to work for our children in the fall um, and what happened in the spring was you know just unprecedented it had never happened before we've never been in this situation before um, but I do want to clarify a couple things so I have homeschooled off and on mostly on for the last 22 years and I have two homeschool graduates two and a half but we won't talk about that one <laughs> Um, two and a half homeschool graduates and um, but what happened in the spring and what will be happening in the fall for most is not homeschooling it is survival school uh, for everybody it was survival school for the teachers for those of you who had children in day school uh, and including me uh, that was survival school for the teachers, for the administration, and for the students and the parents. And it was crazy. It was so difficult with, you know, knowing who's checking in with who at what time and all the virtual stuff. And I have two of my guys who are in day school have special needs. And so that was crazy. It was crazy. I was overwhelmed. And I've, I've taught my children for a very long time. So um, but homeschoolers generally don't just sit at home. <laughs> so even for homeschoolers, it was quite a change and a difference to not be able to go anywhere and not meet up with the people that they were um, used, used to meeting up with and not participate in the classes and, and programs that most, many, many homeschoolers participate in. Um, so everything was closed down for everybody. And the only place where homeschoolers maybe had a leg up was they already had curriculum and they already knew how to, um, you know, what their focus was when they were teaching their kids, uh, you know, with the curriculum, with uh, if you have multiple children. Most of us already have ways if we have multiple children to teach um, a subject to the different grade levels. So, for example, history and science, uh, we're not just necessarily going to have it for, you know, every subject is not going to be for each child. There are some things that we can do together. So as a homeschooler, and I think for most families, there are kind of three goals or maybe four goals. Our, our number one goal is to live our faith, that our faith is the most important thing, um, and we live it everywhere. It's not something that we do, just like church, it's not something that we visit on Sundays, or we just, you know, watch on TV, as the case may be right now, but it's something that we live all the time, it's who we are, and everything is going to be influenced, or should be influenced by um, our faith. So we have goals with our te the, the teaching of our children, whether we homeschool or not. Um, I found that many families have these some of these same goals. And the first one is we want to instill a love of learning in our children. We want them to not just, you know, learn for the sake of learning, but we want them to want to pursue knowledge and wisdom. We want them to pursue past high school, past college, if they go to college. We want them to always be open to learning, to growing, um, to expanding their understanding of God and the world around them, right? So that is kind of the first, the first thing on 
on many homeschoolers lists and I think many parents lists in general whether you send your child to day school or not. The second thing that is very important uh, for us and for many is to teach our children how to think not what to think. Now this one sounds a little scary because <laughs> It it may sound like I'm saying, you know, it doesn't matter what they think, but, you know, just give them that freedom. And um, that's not what I'm saying. Our, our family, we are an Orthodox Christian family. We're going to raise our children in the Orthodox Christian faith. Everything that we do is going to have something to do with that. And at the same time, we want our children to learn how to think because if we only teach them what to think the moment that they're challenged when they're when they get older and they're off somewhere and they can't you know come ask mom or dad hey somebody you know so and so said this and is that true they need to know how to think and reason not just to be able to debate i don't just mean like general law. Well, I kind of mean that, but you know, I don't, I don't mean just so that they can go and debate things, but so they can stop and think and not always have a knee jerk reaction and, um, really think things through because as they get older, they're going to be doing it anyway. And so if we can encourage them in the thinking process, how to think, um, then they're going to come to better conclusions when they're faced with challenging ideology. So that is something that's very important to us. Uh, and, and our kids often are going to kind of at one point, point or another reject what we believe. Um, most of us did when we were growing up. Not all, but most of us did <laughs> when we were growing up. But the ability to think for ourselves and not just be told um, what to think. Because I grew up in a tradition where a lot of it was, this is what you think. And this, you know, it was, it was witnessing 101 and faith 101. You know, there were all these little workshops and stuff that they did to try to teach you how to think so that if you went and, you know, went door to door telling people about Jesus, it was almost scripted and life is not scripted. So if we raise our children that way, they're totally caught off guard and destroyed when, when life is different than they expected or when bad things happen or when maybe they're mistreated at church by people who are supposed to be the most loving and kind. We want them to know how to think and how to navigate their brains and to um, essentially filter everything through Christ is the ultimate goal, but we're teaching them how to think. Um, and, you know, even with adult children now, not all of them are in agreement with things, but I see the process going. They're not just settling even on their own ideas. They're not just settling they're trying to weed through because we try to teach them how to think, not what to think. Then we also want our children to have a functional knowledge of the whatever they're learning. So I had a friend in high school who was a straight A student. She was the captain of the cheerleading squad. She was just Loma's perfect <laughs> in so many ways. Um, but what I noticed was she, uh, she did very well on tests. I did horribly on tests. I still have a problem with my brain like emptying if I think something could possibly be a test. Um, but she aced every test that she took because she could cram a whole bunch of information in there take the test and then she would pretty much immediately, it was like she pressed a button and there was a flush. And if you asked her um, about the information she was supposed to know or how to apply it, she had no idea, none. She did not have a functional knowledge of what she was supposed to have learned. 
And so we really want to encourage that. It's not about the tests. Tests can only measure certain things. Um, but um, working with our children to develop a functional knowledge for them to be able to apply what they're learning or show it back to us. And I don't mean in like a book report kind of way, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, but in a, you know, in, in, yeah, being able to apply it in different parts of their lives or places where it is useful to have that knowledge and that information where it can be practical or where it can benefit somebody or themselves. Um, that is, that is what we're trying to do, not just to have the book knowledge, but to have that real functional knowledge, um, that we'll be able to recall and use for our benefits in the future. Another thing that's important to know, and I, I don't, I'm not down on teachers at all. I have a great respect for teachers, um, and the administration and everybody that's worked so hard this season to make school happen for so many kids in a way that nobody's experienced before, really. Um, not to this degree anyway. Um, real respect for teachers. So I'm not, I'm not slamming anybody, but, um, the way teachers are taught to teach, um, is with the idea that you have a large classroom and that you have a, a single level. So unless you're doing like Montessori that has three levels per section, like first, second, and third together, um, unless you're in a Montessori type situation or some other interesting charter type situation, teachers are either taught to teach one subject or one grade level. Um, or the, sorry, uh, they are like in elementary school, a teacher is taught to teach elementary school. Um, but they're teaching one group of kids in a classroom, right? So they're teaching one grade at a time. They're not teaching multiple grades at a time. And at home, if you have more than one child, if they're not twins, <laughs> you're generally teaching more than one grade at a time. And so it does not need to look like the classroom. The, the classroom model is specific to what it kind of needs to be in that setting. And when you're home, it's beneficial to reconsider what the configuration of your school day might look like based on who you have in your home and the different age groups you might be um, teaching. At home, you can do a lot more hands-on activities. And even for middle school and high school, it doesn't just have to be for elementary school or the little ones. Older ones love to do hands-on stuff too. I remember in high school, it was when we were doing labs for science or some sort of interactive something for history. That's when I got excited. Um, and I think a lot of the other kids do, did as well. So, you know, that's high school. We like to do things. Children, you know, the mind is still developing and we want to encourage, um, exploration and, and because in the doing, sometimes they come up with different ways of doing things or different ways of looking at things or different um, they ask different questions because they just experience something and then they start thinking, oh, does this, if I do this, can I also do this? And they, you know, it's, it's a nice little springboard for the potential, because it won't happen every time, um, for the potential to broaden their way of thinking. And that goes back to teaching them how to think, not what to think. So, um, but doing science experiments, doing, um, acting out parts of history. Uh, right now I can't go to museums, but you can, a lot of museums have interactive opportunities now with all the shutdowns where you can, you know, do virtual tours of things, or you can, um, you know, view a bit of art and try to, um, recreate it in that style or the same with music. You can, you can play games, um, with music and, um, 
um, you can go and experience nature and do like botany <laughs> and go on nature walks and explore and do because everything is learning, but we don't have to turn everything into an official lesson. That is important. And that is one thing I wish I had known before I started homeschooling, um, that everything does not need to be okay. So what did you learn? Okay. So what did you learn? Okay. So what did you learn? Um, Sometimes we can just learn and then they can contemplate that. I think of the whole big essential oil craze. <laughs> I use essential oils. Um, but with the whole, the beginning of all the essential oil craze a couple years ago, I would have been miserable if I had, because I was naturally curious and I questioned a number of things because I was hearing a number of different things that didn't quite add up, even with the, you know, completely pure and blah, blah companies. So I wanted to research myself. And so I did. I would have been miserable if at every turn it was, so what'd you learn about this oil? So what'd you learn about this oil? So what'd you learn about the history? I was just taking it in. I was in the gathering phase. And that is a lot of our education with our children is they are doing a lot of gathering and filtering. Doesn't mean that we can't have any tests, but it also means that letting them experience is, is the lesson. Some kids like workbooks. <laughs> I have some who are, would like to be a hundred percent hands-on and I have others who are like, can I just do my workbook now? And that is totally fine. There are different learning styles. I'm not going to talk about that here. There are ways to go online and, and find um, tools to help you determine your child's learning style and your own teaching style and how they can be compatible. But there are kids who just love workbooks. They love that sense of, you know, being able to check off what they did. They have this very measurable visual of accomplishment. And some kids need, need that and really thrive on that. So when we think about homeschooling, we don't just throw everything out. We really take into consideration um, our different children and their different learning styles. Unit studies can be a good option for a lot of families. And there are a lot of unit studies out there. And there are instructions out there um, on how to kind of create your own unit study. So once you've maybe done one or two that has been prepackaged, um, you'll get the gist of, of what it looks like to create your own, maybe. Unless you're not that type of person. And then you can keep on looking into the pre-made kind. Uh, and there are so many free resources online that can help you with that. But a unit study is where everything, all the subjects pretty much have to do with the, the thing that you're learning about. Um, so if you're, I don't know, I can't even give an example right now because my brain is fried. But if you're doing um, uh, a unit study on, I don't know baking, <laughs> you're incorporating reading and math. You may be doing the history of, of baking or bread making. I'll just say bread making because I know how to make bread. So you can, you're going to read about bread. You're going to, um, math is going to be, uh, uh, have to do with recipes and measurements. Um, science is going to have to do with like mixtures and how those work together, how you put these ingredients together, you have a mixture and how that creates the bread. Um, did I say the history? You can do the history of the bread. So there's all, all sorts of pieces of, of subjects, um, in school that you can put together around one main topic. And that's what a unit study is. Reading aloud. There is a great um, book and I think podcast and everything called Read Aloud Revival. And it's fantastic. And again, it's not just reading aloud to little people. Uh, big people can absolutely benefit from reading aloud. We do a lot of driving and so we have Audible. And so that makes it helpful for us to have a way to read aloud while we're on the go. Um, 
I enjoy reading aloud, but if you don't enjoy reading aloud, again, something like Audible can be helpful. Uh, libraries have a lot of books on tape. If you have a struggling reader, you you can um, get a book and the audio to go along with it so they can read along. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with read alouds. But one of the things that's good is your children, your child can generally understand um, uh, the spoken language better at a higher level than what they can read. So a third grader may not be able to read Lord of the Rings. Like if they were to sit down and they're, they're still sounding some things out and they're, you know, kind of stop and go with the reading and that makes it frustrating if you were reading that, if they were trying to read that level. But hearing it, they develop their vocabulary because they're hearing words, new words in context. They're getting pronunciation and they are, their brains are really working <laughs> um, in a positive way to make sense of what they're hearing. <clears throat> That's why you can see people who come from other countries who seem to be able to pick up English so easily, but then if you were to test them in the written word or the, or, um, sorry, oh, um, in the written word or, or reading it, um, it's a lot more difficult. <clears throat> but conversationally, um, it is easier um, to understand and for them to speak. So same kind of concept with reading aloud. And there are so many books out there um, that are just really enjoyable. They don't have to be um, they don't have to be quote unquote educational because the idea is we're always learning, right? So fiction is a wonderful way to go. Um, historical fiction is a wonderful way to go for history or to learn about a subject and explore it further. And one thing to avoid with the read alouds, um, and many, uh, much reading. So even if there are um, assigned reading books, uh, I would highly recommend avoiding book reports and uh, making the dioramas and all these things around um, books because we want our children to enjoy reading. <laughs> and there are ways to totally kill that love and desire and that interest in reading when we make it an assignment. And we don't have to make it an assignment in order to still be able to measure their understanding. A lot of that can come in the form of discussion. Just like, wow, I wasn't expecting that to happen because the idea is that you're probably all listening to it together. Um, I grew up in a home that did that. My brother was severely dyslexic and saw in triple. And so the librarian would record any book. And I had no idea until I was an adult, I thought it was on the radio. <laughs> um, but we would come in at a certain time and we would listen and then, you know, go on our way. But though I remember those books, I remember that experience and we could talk about it. Um, you know, we uh, just uh, discussions. That's how we can measure um, how our children are learning if they're absorbing it, if they're like, I don't know, I don't know, then maybe we go back a chapter and we listen at it in smaller increments or something like that. But to be engaged with our children being like, I did not see that coming. Or did you know that they did that at that time period? I had no idea. And yeah, I didn't know that either. And blah, blah, you know, so having that discussion that is still measurable learning. You, you can still measure their progress and their comprehension. Homeschooling also gives entrepreneurial opportunities. I love this part. So we live in a time where there does not need to be necessarily the push for our children to go to college. Um, it does not have all, it does not always have the same benefit as it used to. It used to 
really say something to an employer that you had a college degree. And in some areas of, of education and business, it is still important for your child to have a degree. Um, but there are also other, there are also more opportunities out there for entrepreneurialism, <laughs> for children to learn to create their own work. We're still encouraging drive. We're still encouraging good work ethic. We're still encouraging um, our children taking responsibility. And we're encouraging creativity, which can be an amazing thing. It can be anything from an Etsy store where they figure out how to make and market something that they've created. It could be you have a child. We had kids in the neighborhood when my girls were growing up who loved like garden equipment. They like saved money. They didn't even have a yard, but they saved money and they got like uh, leaf blowers and um, lawn mowers and trailers. And they ended up figuring out ways to earn money around our little community by doing jobs for other people. And that is a reasonable, potentially very profitable business. So it doesn't just have to be, um, you know, a computer tech or, or, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of all the things that you need a degree for, but there are so many opportunities now. And even if they still choose to go to college and that is what they need to do or want to do, um, to go farther on the path, or it's going to help them determine what they want to do long term. That's perfectly fine, but having an opportunity to create something and try to market it and and um, have a business does a lot for a child and for the family. My girls, um, when they were young, we lived on the corner in this little wonderful redwood community uh, in California. and when they were old enough to bake, I taught them how to make bread. And instead of a lemonade stand, they had a bread stand. And our motto was, buy our bread, we need the dough. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> anyway, um, so they had a bread stand. So every Tuesday, we didn't do any other school. They prepped the kitchen. I made sure it was all clean. Um, they spent hours making this bread. They had French bread and they had whole wheat bread. So, and we had a grinder. So we, they ground the wheat. They, you know, put all the ingredients together. They followed the recipe and all that stuff. They did, had to let everything cool. Cause if you bag things too early, it sweats and it's gross. Um, so they had to learn all these things and then they would lug this. I can't even remember what we used. I don't know if it was a table or if we had a spool or something, but we had something that went out into the road or to the end of our driveway and we had our sign and they were the salespeople and I stayed back at the house. I could still see them, but I stayed back at the house and they developed their, their regulars. Now, none of them are bread bakers. They are all grown. They are 23, 20, almost 25 and 26. And they, know, they all know how to make bread, but none of them are really bread bakers. But they all remember that experience. And I think that has helped all of them to develop a really good work ethic. They had to learn how to interact with the public. They were making change. They, you know, all these different, lots of different ways that they were enriched, even though that's not what they pursued later. Because it's not necessarily about what they pursue later. It's about the experience and being able to draw from that experience, that, that functional knowledge or functional wisdom. They were able to draw from that experience and put it into the things that they did end up pursuing. And that's kind of the point. And one other thing that is super helpful with homeschooling is you do have multiple grades that can do the same thing. So... Um, one of the things that was so difficult for me with, with the online learning is that each, each child 
was doing their own set of things. And I felt like I was just running back and forth to make sure everybody was still on task and you're meeting with this teacher and you're supposed to be doing this now and all of that it was miserable for me. <clears throat> um, but with homeschooling, if you have more than one child, um, they can do their math and their reading independently or math and language arts independently. And then you guys come together for a history day or a science day or an art day or a music day or whatever day <laughs> that you want to do. And um, of course, maybe you'll require more from your, you know, junior in high school to, to have more understanding or to dig a little deeper. Um, then you will for your, your younger people. So maybe you do an experiment together and then your older ones need to reproduce that experiment or come up with something that's similar that can accomplish the same outcome or, or reach the same outcome. And then the younger ones, they do the experiment and then they get to talk to you about it or they get to, you know, draw pictures in their journal of the process or something like that. So there are ways to incorporate it so the whole family is enjoying the learning. I know one of the things I love the most about homeschooling is there's so I talked my whole way through my whole education. So K through 12, I think on every report card or at least K through 11 was excessive talking. I talk a lot. <laughs> and um, so there's a lot, honestly, that I missed because I was talking. And when I was homeschooling my, especially my older girls, um, the homeschooling process, I learned a lot right along with them. And that was wonderful. I enjoyed that so much. And with all of these things that I've talked about, all of these things have a way to measure progress. It doesn't have to be a test. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, in writing, yes, I know this information. It can be um, just you've had a discussion and you can mark down. They knew this, 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 and this. And they don't even have to know that they're being, um, that their knowledge is being measured. You can um, videotape a response. A lot of kids want to do YouTube things um, or have YouTube channels, be podcasters, and you can incorporate that as part of their way of, you know, if you encourage them to teach somebody what they just learned, um, you can document that by video. If they're acting something out, my, my friend's son um, dressed up and acted out a Bible story and sent it to me. And it was so funny. I think it was David and Goliath. Anyway, it was so funny. Um, but they enjoyed it and they really understood the Bible story. But it wasn't like, hey, we're going to do this play so that you can, we can, you know, we need this record to show that you know that. It was so fun, and she's really good at just doing fun things, but it was so fun and funny and silly and, and remarkable. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to measure whether or not your child understands the content. If you really feel, so when I first started homeschooling, I was totally terrified that I was going to destroy my children, so there was a lot of fear um, and I didn't even realize that, that I was doing a lot of fear-based homeschooling, but I was, because that was kind of what was out there. Um, what's out there now is, what about socialization? I'm sorry. We all talk. <laughs> I'm their mother. They're going to, they're going to be social. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but if you are determined to get like a full curriculum, which is not a bad thing, there's some really, really great curriculums out there. So if you're determined to get a full curriculum, the wonderful thing is that the teacher's books, have the answers and often have lesson plans. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if you are a person that feels like the way I need to teach is with a curriculum, the teacher's book is right there, has the answers, has like for math, it'll show, um, um, you know, how to work the problems and, and, uh, you know, for everything, it shows exactly what you're supposed to do or what the child is supposed to know. Some of them are honestly fully scripted. It'll say what you are supposed to say and what you're supposed to be getting back from your child. Teachers have the teacher book. They don't just know everything. They're taught how to teach, but they don't just have 
most of them, don't just have all that information in their heads at all times. So they, that's why they do lesson plans. They, they, you know, make a plan of how they're going to present the material. Um, and, and they have access to the book in case they forget. <laughs> so, um, while teachers are superheroes, they also have the book. So that's important to understand when we're looking at the place where we are now of having to educate our children. And finally, you know your child. It is okay for you or important for you to determine what the best way of educating your children, child is, or children is going to be. That may be you homeschooling. That may, you might find great freedom in homeschooling. Um, you may find the best way for your child and for yourself is for them to continue with the online learning or if there are in, in person classroom opportunities and it's all okay, but you are the best qualified to determine that because they are your children. These are our children. We know them best. That doesn't mean that we don't go get input and, seek counsel from others who have different experiences that can help us make that decision. But ultimately we are the ones who, um, know our kids the best. So anyway, there's all of that. Let's keep on working out our, our, our salvation. One mama moment at a time. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.